Welcome, Dan Fitzpatrick. Dan is just an absolute wealth of knowledge, and we are so lucky to have him here today. He's been beekeeping for over 15 years. He's an educator. He's just, I mean, the man knows, it feels like everything about everything, Dan. Um, so we, when we sat down to really talk about which skill in particular we wanted to share, we thought we'd start here because a lot of, I know a lot of you, uh, I myself am a new beekeeper and a lot of us got questions on, on exactly what these magnificent um, insects do. So I'm going to stop talking because I don't know anything about them and I'm going to let Dan take over. Go ahead, Dan, the stage is yours. Hey, hey everybody, welcome to beekeeping. Um, I'm Dan Fitzpatrick. Uh, I seem to have a concentration on knowledge because probably because I taught at a small school and I taught six different science subjects at the same time. So I got a lot of, a lot of agglomeration here. So we're going to start off learning about these bees. And one thing I like to start off with is a little bit of science because as a beekeeper or as a fly fisher or as both, you kind of get recognized as the voice of the insects, you know, for other people. And um, it's important to be able to reach out and find that info. And a lot of that info is in some of this science nomenclature and those kinds of things. So we're gonna have a little look at that. And then we're going to look at housing your bees, getting your bees, setting up the yard, tools, diseases, and where do I go from here? So if you get questions, go ahead and put them down there for April. Uh, I'm gonna set up on my website to answer all the questions I can and also to give some reference for the notes so you're not just like scribbling things down. But we got a lot of stuff to go over today and uh, it's gonna be a great class, you're gonna like it. So here's how bees fit in. They're animals, they're kingdom animalia, and they're arthropods, which means they have those little shells and the crustaceans and those kinds of things. And so we go kingdom phylum class insect. Insects all have six legs. And as we get closer and closer to bees, the insects are going to get more and more similar. So if you learn something about class insecta, you actually learn about millions of insects all at once. And it saves a lot of time. You know, learning about these bigger groups helps. And that's why the taxonomy is a good thing to, to just, you know, find out about. On most Wikipedias, if you look up any insect, it'll have all the taxonomy in a little window and you can, you can go up the chart and uh, kind of have a look at that. So if we go to the major orders of insect, you can see they're starting to look a lot more similar. Maybe you're a lepidopterist and you collect butterflies. Or uh, maybe you think uh, you see a bee and it's one of these. But uh, unfortunately, these only have two wings this is called diptera, and bees have four wings. Okay, so this is the order that bees are in. They got four wings, and then they got some kind of thing either to lay eggs or sting or something like that on their hind end, and this is the bee group, Hymnoptera. So we're gonna go down to the more closer to the bees, to the genus level. We've got genus and species is the end. And right here, letter A, is Apis mellifera, the, the honeybee that people raise. These are other honeybees, and all of these bees are actually native to Europe and Asia. Eurasia is where the native land of the honeybee is. So in North America, honeybees aren't really native. Um, I don't believe most people consider them harmful or invasive at all. They're just out here because people brought them, because they make honey. So here's some of the parts of the bee. Uh, here are those wings. You can see that the wings up here are kind of stitched together a little bit. Uh, bees do have a long kind of proboscis to suck out the nectar. They also got the pinching mouth parts. Um, not so much to look at here. And let's 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 talk about the how they survive out there. Um, bees live together as a colony. Okay, so the 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 group is what is supposed to be there all the time for bees. And that's why they make so much honey. Because in the winter, when there's no flowers, uh, they're feeding all these colony members with the surplus. And so that's why they're beneficial to keep, because these bees are gonna keep storing this honey away 
and they kind of work together. And in this colony, we got three kinds of bees it, that are, are in this group. And it's also similar with ants, which is also in that same kind of grouping. We got the queen, we got the male bee called the drone, and then we got the worker bee. Those are the three bees. And if you're gonna keep bees, it's helpful to know what their perspective is so that you can kind of arrange for them to just do what they naturally do. Um, here we got the queen bee. And this, there's usually only one queen bee. And the queen bee is responsible for laying all the eggs. Uh, they lay up to twice their body weight in eggs. Um, and that's a lot. All the worker bees continuously feed this queen. And this queen does a lot of different things for the hive. Queen bees and all the bees start off as an egg. And most people don't know that they have this little caterpillar kind of stage. And as, as they grow, the worker bees feed them till they get big. Then they spin a cocoon and the cell gets capped. And then they emerge as an adult bee. So that's what's going on in this hive as they make baby bees. Now all the bees start this way, but queen bees are a little different than the rest of the bees because they grow fastest. If you look up here, here's the different life cycles of all of them. The male bee grows the slowest and then the queen bee grows the fastest. And you can see there's a little line up here drawn across the top. And that's because all of the bees get fed the same thing for the first three days. Those worker bees are gonna come out and feed those baby bees. And they're gonna feed them secretions from their mandibles called royal jelly. If we look over here in this right picture, you'll see a little of that royal jelly in the bottom there. And you'll see some bee larva. And down here, I got the bee larva growing big. After three days, the other two groups of bees do not get fed this royal jelly as much. They get fed what they call maybe worker jelly, but they also get fed a bee bread, which is little pollen chunks and honey. And so even though an egg is a female bee, it could get fed royal jelly and become a queen, or it could get fed this bee bread and become a worker. So all workers are female bees, and if they get fed well, they get reproductive organs of a big size, and they can be queens. Uh, can they lay eggs? Sometimes in male functioning hives, sometimes you could get worker laying eggs, and they actually do hatch. And we'll talk about that with the drone bees. Okay, so here's some queen bees. Queen bees are bigger, and uh, they do make large cells, and they fill it with that um, royal jelly. And then those bees eat the royal jelly. And then once that queen hatches out, uh, the first one to hatch out usually will find the other ones hatching out and kill the other queens. And we'll talk about why this happens when we talk about swarms. But first, let's talk a little bit about the worker bees. Worker bees are those other eggs. They're 98% of the hive. And the worker bees are the ones that sting you. Uh, worker bees make this, uh, the wax here in their abdomens, and that is secreted by them, and then they use that to make the hive up. And if you look at their life cycle, basically the first week, they're nurse bees, that's what they call them, and they're gonna go around the hive feeding larvae and cleaning things up. Then they'll build the honeycomb, then they'll guard the hive, and then they'll forage for nectar. So that's the life cycle of these worker bees. And so you got a queen bee laying a bunch of eggs, worker bees taking care of this and doing the nectar foraging and guarding the hive and doing the stinging. What do drone bees do? They are kind of lazy. They don't have the sharp stinger. They got another kind of stinger. Uh, their main job is to uh, find the queen. And so these drone bees will kind of go out and is some unusual area in the sky called a drone congregation area. And they'll go looking around for the queen. If you look at the picture, this drone on the right, you can see he has really big eyes. And so he does do a lot of looking for that queen. 
and it's in some kind of airspace that queens go to to mate. And so here's that drone giving his sting of love to the queen. And that's how they fertilize. And the queen will mate with multiple drones and then return to the hive. Queens don't normally leave the hive, but a virgin queen that just hatched, she'll take a flight and find drones and she'll take one mating flight, they only do one, they'll store it all away in a special organ and then she'll return. And, or the other time a, bee, a queen bee will fly is when there's a swarm. So this is how honeybees stack up with bumblebees. There's usually at the beginning at least one queen. Uh, but honeybees always retain just one queen most of the time. Sometimes an old queen kind of gets tired and they'll replace her with a daughter and they'll both be alive for a really short period of time. But for the most part, they just have the one queen. And then bumblebees start off with just a solitary queen that kind of buried herself in the, in the dirt or I, mean, I don't think they use the honey pot. I think they go bury themselves and they come back out. And then they got worker bees and then they got drone bees. So a very similar structure in a lot of bee families that have the hive. So what's a swarm? A swarm is when the older queen and most of the older workers from the hive leave. And why do they leave? They need each other. They need the bee. The strategy of the bee is to work as a group to collect this nectar and be together. So they leave as a group. They don't all leave. Half of, about half of them leave in this thing called the swarm. And the old queen goes out with the swarm and then the bees kind of look for places to live. All the hives that we have start with a swarm, whether it's artificial or it's man-made, you're gonna start your hive with a swarm. And this is the natural way they produce. So they have a queen and a bunch of workers and they go into a new place, the workers start building comb and then the queen starts laying and then off you go. Usually the queen in a swarm is a fertilized queen. So she's the old queen. The new queen hatches out here and then she kills the other queens, takes a mating flight, and comes back and starts laying. So these are some pictures of swarms. And this is our first opportunity where I'm going to show you how to get bees. Okay, so if somehow a friend of yours decides to say, hey, there's a swarm of bees in my yard. That's an opportunity for you to get free bees. And I'm, I'm all about getting the free bees because when you buy a package, it's at least $150. So there's one incentive. But a second incentive of getting the local wild bees is you have good genetics. The bees that, that make swarms in your area, as long as they're not from some beekeeper's hive, those have survived there through pests and, and the weather and everything else that your environment has conditions for. So you got some great genetic stock. So we're gonna try this out. We're, we're one, I was wondering about this video thing here. It was a little patchy, but I'm gonna try it anyway. I got a picture of a great viral YouTube of some guys doing a swarm. And so we're gonna check that out and have a look at their swarm. So let's see if it works. Yeah, How's that on your end, April? Uh, it's still loading. Is it still loading? It's, uh, I think you're the, oh, no, it's working. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, so these, these guys found a swarm of bees and this guy's sticking his hand into it. And you might be like, that guy's crazy. But it, when you get to know the bees, it's not such a crazy idea because they are not at home. These are bees that have no place to go. They, they're, they're looking for a new hive. They got no baby bees, there's no honey. They're just looking for a place to live. And so at this state, it's fairly calm and easy to, uh, to manage those bees. I would still recommend using a veil. You know, this here, or we'll see if we can, yeah, here we go. There's a satisfying guy just reaching up there with a hand covered full of bees. Have you ever seen that, um, that uh, bee beard? You know, when those people have those bee beards and stuff like that? Uh, that's a swarm of bees. So those guys have like a queen in a cage on a string usually on their chin 
and then they got the bee beard going off of that. Oh. So that's that's what's going on. And yeah, they're really calm at that point. And uh, that is definitely a moment to just sit there for a minute and enjoy the the beekeeping feeling. I can't really describe it, but when you're around these calm, gentle bees at this state, there's there's a feeling that wells up inside you. It's amazing. All right, so then these guys do this method to take the bees home. So they're just knock them off into a box, and then they're going to take this box home to a hive. And that is what you can do too if somebody calls you about a swarm. You get all the free bees you want. And I'm going to talk to you next. Next, I'm going to tell you about where to put the bees. Don't worry so much about that. But I want to talk to you about getting the swarm. These guys are doing it with a note card, and that's being nice. Uh, but there is a slightly better way to do the uh, swarm here. And let me see if I can get that video. Here, let me get that video started. I want to show you how I do it. I usually just knock the branch. And so let's see here. I caught a swarm this summer. And uh, let me get to the screen here. Let's see. There. Is this one working too, April? Yeah. It's probably kind of patchy, but so me and my son found a swarm this summer and they were in the trees. I got to watch them. They all started off in the air and I watched them all collect on this branch. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go almost to the part where I knock them in. So I got my hive open and ready right under the swarm. And what I do is I just hit that branch and they all fall down into it. That's probably the better way to go if you got the branch ready. I would just knock them into it. And, and that's a much easier way to go. Um, if they're way up in a tree, uh, there's another technique I'm gonna show you, hopefully, maybe. See if I can get this zoom thing back on. Uh, let's see. You could just use a um, one of those uh, pear peach or apple pickers. You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's like an apple picker. Here, can you see this apple picker on here? Yeah, with the bucket. I got a bucket and an apple picker, and I just hit that branch real hard, and then I lower it down. Okay, so if you got a really tall swarm, I just get one of those apple pickers and a bucket, and I just nail that guy. They all fall in the bucket, and you lower it down real quick. And then either you could put some screen over the bucket, or you can pour it in your cardboard box, or you can pour it directly into your hive. And uh, that's definitely the way to go. Definitely the way to go. All right. Let's see here. I got this show back here and we are about ready to look at where to put bees mm -hmm. all right new share slideshow sharing this slideshow huh. doesn't want to go it's interesting yeah, I know. We can every time we troubleshoot, you just never know what you're going to find. Um, yeah, I think I had to end the show there, and then let me... Okay, just start uh, it again. Yeah, I'll just start it again. <laughs> there we go, and how are we doing? Yeah, it's um, it might clear up. It's a little bit blurry. Is it? All right, yeah. I mean, oh, you know what? I got the boxes checked, aren't it? Optimization, yeah, for some reason. With your presentation, the optimization is funky. But yeah, as soon as we yeah, the, the, it, it's, it's really weird. So sorry about this, everybody. But when I go to video to my slides, it just doesn't like it. Yeah. All right. How about this? Yeah, I'll let you know. Is this good? It should be okay, yeah. Um I think I got it on the picture. Yep, yep. Yep, we're good there. Okay, so this is not a swarm. Okay, so if somebody says, I've got bees, and it looks like this, you don't want to reach in there. They're going to be mad. 
this is a hive and this is what the hives look like naturally this is where you know what bees are going to do on their own okay so removing a hive from a house i would not recommend to a beginning beekeeper because it's messy also you're going to have trouble finding that queen in there good luck um, i'm not saying it's impossible but it's it's another level of experience uh, for you. I would go for a wild swarm for sure. Anybody who's got one of those out, go get it. That's that's amazing. This, here's, here's what I want to do with this. This is a great way to talk, to start the discussion about where are we going to put these bees. Dan, I'm going to interrupt you real quick just because of the intricacy of what we're looking at. Um, because of the optimization, it's made your slides blurry. So now that we've unclicked the optimization, would you mind exiting from your presentation and then restarting it and it will be um, unblurry. Okay, so I've ended the show. There you go, now press start and it should be perfect. And then I don't have those things. And I will slide the slide. How's that? I'll let you know in two seconds. Is it perfect, excellent. Okay, all right, now we're good. Okay, cool. So I have a look at these, yeah, sorry it was blurry. Um, this is this is natural. This is what bees are going to want. And the number one thing I want you to notice is look at the spacing here with that comb on that top left picture. See how that's spaced? That's what they like. Also, if you look at this big log on the bottom, on the top it's lighter comb and that's where they store honey is on top and below is where they hatch the baby bees. That's another key aspect of their behavior that's important. So here's some guy who just forgot to put a frames in his box and look what they did. The same spacing as what you saw in the house. Here are the, I think this is called the sun hive. So some people have done this for biodynamic beekeeping. I don't really think that this one is really approachable to harvest out of but I really love their landing platform on that bottom left. That's just amazing watching the bees land and climb up all naturally. Uh, that's, pr that's pretty cool. Uh, this hive is uh, the flow hive. Uh, and in here, people have engineered like a little rig to break all the comb up and then the honey dumps in these uh, jars. I will advise you not to get this as your first hive. Uh, part of the problem is uh, not all honey stays liquid. I don't know if, about you, but I've had some jars where it crystallizes and certain seasons of honey are gonna crystallize in here and it's not gonna flow. But also, much like anything else, it's way more expensive to buy this than it would be to buy like three regular hives. So you'd probably wanna do that to start off. I would, I would definitely buy a regular hive. Here's the old school hives. It would just be a straw thing and they'd just juice up all the bees and everything in there. Here's a bunch of homemade hives. This one is an observation hive. Look at how tall that is. It just got glass in there so people can watch the bees. In Kenya, they just use a box. They got the slats, they space them, and voila, the bees build the comb to the shape of the hive. In, in Russia and Ukraine, a lot of people do long hives and they got like a little hinge and the bees just kind of go sideways. Uh, here's a barrel shaped hive. Here's a hive with no sides to the frames. But if you look at on the sides here, here's the main function, the spacing. That's what you want to do. And so I'm gonna recommend to everybody here, let's just do a regular hive with these boxes and frames because number one, the equipment's available everywhere. Number two, there's gonna be a million peers and friends that are already beekeeping that you can come in contact with and they'll know exactly what you're touching and doing. And you know, it's been around so long because it works. So I, I would just say to use a regular hive to start on your starting one. Now you got some box sizes there. You could do this big deep box or you could do medium boxes or shallow boxes. I'm I'm, I wouldn't advise against just picking one size and using all that size. That's not such a bad idea. Uh, but other than that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really alter anything about this normal hive. 
in those hives, there are frames. And I, I think making the frames would take forever. I think what you'd want to do is uh, just buy the frames and they sell sheets of wax to put in there. Uh, it's up to you if you want to use that. Uh, the wax is a dollar a sheet or more. Or, or you could let the bees build their own comb in there. Uh, you run the risk of them deciding to build it a different direction than your frames. Uh, they do that sometimes. Or you could do a little bit of both. You could have some of these and some of those and checkerboard it. And every other frame is empty. Every other frame is full. They're going to go along the frames that way. And uh, that might be a, a good option for you. But yeah, I've, I've just put three popsicle sticks in there and then they just build. And that's fine with me. Um, if you have one of those honey spinners, we'll get to that later in equipment. Uh, you need the wire or you need the support in those frames to, for the centripetal force as it goes around in there. So you will probably need to buy those. But I don't do that for my honey. We'll get to that in a minute. So here's some mediums, and these are all stacks of mediums that works. Uh, sometimes people who have trouble lifting and bad backs, they even downsize them to eight. But let me tell you something. You can combine any of these ideas that you saw in the housing together. Here's an eight and a 10, they just put a board there, right? Here's a long hive that goes up eventually. Okay, so that, that you could, it's, it's wherever you wanna put them. Uh, for the bee space. But generally the rule is you start with just one box, you let them fill seven out of 10 frames, then you put the next box on. Because if you make it huge, they're not gonna be able to defend against all the other things that wanna eat honey. So you just do a little at a time and you build it up. Okay, so this brings us to package bees. So if you wanna start beekeeping for sure, and you want a guaranteed swarm of bees, you can buy a package of bees. And what's gonna be in there, there's gonna be a little queen in a box. You'll, uh, you'll have to shake the thing down, uh, take out a little cork out of the box and put it into your hive. And then you shake out all the bees. I would shake them all out. And then you put the lid on and then you've installed the hive. The bees will either let the queen out immediately or there's a little bit of sugar in one of those corners and they'll eat through the sugar in a day or so and then the queen will come out then. And then you have an artificial swarm. So how they made this is there's some guys that separated all the baby queen cells in a hive and put them each in their own hive and they let the queens come out and not kill each other, right? So then they had all these queens, they went out, took a mating flight, they came back, they check how much they lay and you make sure that they're doing something good in a pattern in there. And then they box them up, shake a bunch of bees in this box and mail it to you. And over the three days of shipping, they get to know each other. So that's what a package is. After you install this package, you're gonna wait to mess around with your hive. If you keep messing around in there, they're gonna kind of get upset. Same with uh, catching a swarm. Let, let it sit about 10 days because otherwise you might uh, give them agitation enough where they might be like, well, we'll pick a different place to live. But my method um, that I would recommend besides catching the wild swarms is to fish for bees, uh, put out a bait box. Uh, I have caught swarms almost every year by just putting an old piece of my equipment out and putting it under a tree somewhere. Those bees do this. Here's what they do. That swarm that you, you saw earlier, the bees are going to investigate different areas. And when they come back, they're going to dance. They're going to do the waggle dance that you've heard about with bees. And they're going to vote. And once you get 100 bees voting or so to go to a location, they will all go to that location and choose it. So when you make a swarm trap, what you would wanna do is you'd wanna hedge all your odds so that bees vote for your box. You want their vote. So what helps the swarm trap? And this is like somebody's store-bought kind of swarm trap, and it's nice. I would just use two of those medium-sized boxes, or I'd use one deep-sized box, and that's just about the right size. You want about an eight to 10, 12 gallon size. 
that is one box to check off. That'll increase your odds. There is a oil called lemongrass oil. And that is something, the, the bees, when they mark a good spot, they'll leave this scent. And it smells very much like lemongrass. And so if you put a couple dabs of lemongrass in there, those bees are going to uh, be marked. They're going to be like, oh, this is marked. We better go check it out. That kind of stuff. You can buy these little, I don't know if you can see them very good. There's these little clear tubes and you can put the lemongrass in there and it'll last a much longer time. Or you could also put some lemongrass down and melt some wax on it and keep it in that wood because bees can, they're really sensitive to the smell. Um, but I have a link to those tubes later if you're curious. Uh, old comb. So if it smells like bees have lived there, uh, bees don't want to live next to the hive next door, right? So we want about 300 yards from your hive. Uh, it's visible. You don't want to hide it somewhere. You want to put it out uh, around a tree. 12 foot up, I don't know if you really want to climb that tree. Honestly, I don't usually do the 12 foot up unless I got a nice deer stand that I'm comfortable in. Otherwise, I'll just set them on the ground. You don't need to do all of these, right? You just want as many as possible. And then a uh, two square inch entrance. These are all things that bees are looking for in their ideal hive. And they're going to go there and they're going to vote. And then they're going to move in there. And then it, they're already in there. And then that's it. Now, after you catch these bees, it depends. If they just moved in there that day, Sure, you, you could probably move your hive, no problem. Uh, you could move a hive that's up high down to the bottom of a tree because it's natural for a tree to fall over sometimes. But if they've started building comb in there, there's a lot of bees that want to come back to the hive. And you can get around that idea for them. You can change their minds. You'll just have to move your hive about five miles away. You'll have to do it at nighttime, cover it up, and uh, go out there because I'll be home at night and make sure you tape everything because they like to crawl at night. But you know, if you have the little screen over the top and it's pretty secured, you know, <laughs> at dusk, you can move them five miles away to somebody else's house, let them live there for a week, open it up, let them live there for a week, and then move it five miles back to wherever, the, wherever you want it, okay? But if you just move this, there you, what you would find is a bunch of bees just hitting that tree, swarming and clustering on it, and they'd just be confused. You wouldn't know what to do. So generally speaking, you can't move hives very much once you put them out because they get oriented to the sun and the directions and all the landmarks and stuff. But you can just move them back and forth. You might be able to get away with moving them a couple feet a day, you know, but that, it depends on how close or how far you want to do. One last thing, after you've got a swarm in your hive and you moved it, put another one up there. You might catch two or three. You know, that this is a typical spring happening. May, June, and July are hot for catching swarms. Uh, but you probably want to get May and June because then you'll have a, a hive that's ready to make honey. In your hive area where you want to put these boxes, I would consider water. You don't want it to flood. Uh, you would want some water to be around the bees, though, because they do drink and they need water. A water tank or bird bats work. I would put little rocks in there so they don't drown. A uh, floating board or something like that, right? Um, open areas with sunshine are helpful. Uh, depending on if you got a super hot climate, you might want to put them in a tree that gets, you know, noontime shade. But generally, like the morning sun and the afternoon sun, that keeps them warmer, and that's a good thing for bees. They get to spend that less energy keeping warm, and then they're more active that first thing in the morning with that sun shining on their hive. All these things are also something you got to hedge. You know, you don't got to have them all. Just find a good place to put them that you like that you like to visit. That's where I started out. I just picked some places on my farm that I like to just chill out for a while. All right. So what else do we need? You're gonna need a smoker. And we'll talk about smokers. Um, you'll need a suit. You'll need a top and bottom board. And don't worry, I got this all on a list next. Uh, here we go. So you're going to need, I, I started off with five medium supers. Uh, you could do two deeps and three mediums. 
that's the that's the traditional Langstroth hive, but I just got it here. This is on my website too for you. And um, what I would do is I would build my own. Those boxes are pretty easy. I got a pretty good tutorial on how to do that. Uh, a jacket with veil, I would do the zip jacket with a veil. That's a decent equipment that you'll use all the time. I had a friend who first just bought the full suit and he didn't want to keep putting it on. Uh, and that is a problem. At first, you're kind of scared of them, I get it. But that jacket with a veil, and if you got jeans and you put your socks up around your jeans at the bottom, you're gonna be just fine. It's, unless it's like tipped over, unless you're trying to get them out of a house or just tipped over in a storm, then yeah, maybe you'll wanna get the duct tape out and get a you know decent suit on. Uh, the smoker, you'll need some hive tools, uh, buckets, frames, foundation. We talked about frames, we talked about the foundation. You can save a little money with the popsicle sticks. The bees, you know, here we are 155 or swarm trap them for free. You're going to get the best genetics with your swarm trap. Seriously, they're all the local survivor bees in there. So here's my foundationless frames. Here's the hive tools. I, I would just get the regular one, this one on the left. Uh, those, those do help. Bees don't just sit there, you know, the frames aren't just sitting in there, bees bring tree sap and stick them on there. So you're gonna want something to pry that out. And also the boxes are stuck together. So you're gonna to wanna to get in there. Here's some frame grips. I don't use those that much. I usually use this, but you might at first and you might like the frame grips. Uh, gloves, see these bottom right gloves? Those, if you can find them at your farm and fleet or rural store are sting proof. So I don't know I don't know what the name of them are, but I've been able to get some nasty mad bees, and they'd sting on my friend's hand if I had these on, and they wouldn't get me. So this is a good one if you wear if you want to wear gloves. They're kind of bulky, uh, but I guarantee they won't sting. Um, a bee escape is this little maze here, and that's how to get your bees away from the honey. And then uh, I usually use a paintbrush to brush my bees off of things. This, uh, this thing on this bottom left is called a queen excluder. I don't think you should use it. It seems to stop the bees from traveling around the hive and sometimes it just won't go in the next box. I would skip getting those. I would skip getting a donkey. I would skip getting a donkey bee suit. I would not get a plastic box because they're going to be heavy. And if you drop that, it's going to shatter. Okay, so don't do that. So there's some things that you might not need. Uh, hive covers, I would recommend a top cover. Sometimes you want that middle cover, sometimes you don't. Okay, the smoker. You're going to want a good smoker. I would go big because you can always fill it half full, but you can't put more in the small one. That's my logic there. Maybe you like the smaller ones, that's okay too. You can keep stuffing them and fill them. Uh, smokers blow smoke, they blow air through the bottom and heat it up. And what is smoke, what's it doing? Uh, it, it's masking the alarm signals. Bees communicate through releasing chemical messages. And when you put a bunch of smoke on there, it covers them all up. And so their alarm message is not transmitted amongst the bees. So that's one, that's one reason. Second reason is the hive's made of wax and wood and it could burn up. So bees are gonna eat some honey just in case they need to leave and that makes them calm. And then finally, they just don't like the smoke. And if they're all on that top box and you smoke all the top, they'll go down into the hive and then they won't be ready to like fly up and, uh, and sting on you. So here's an example of some of the released hormones and pheromones a queen does. So you can see that this is a normal thing for bees. They release scent and it does all sorts of things. And so this smoke covers up that scent. Um, they're fanning and that does the scent. If a bee stings you, it will leave like a rotten banana scent on that spot on your arm. And I have forgotten to smoke that spot and I reached into a house and it stung me there, or another bee stung me there again. 
and I got stung in the twice, same place twice. So that smoke, if you get stung, smoke your sting area and uh, find some plantain. And we'll, we could talk about edible plants. Uh, the bee suit, super important. I found this really cool on the medieval monks bee suit. They had this little cool uh, woven veil in the face. Here's some natives, native Africans with bee suits, right? Or here's a real bee suit with bees. Um, I would say the jacket of veil is the way to go. You can buy them for kids. I don't, I would try to find them used. Those seem like they, I don't think there's much of a difference on price for kids. I would just get them a veil and, you know, make sure they got long sleeves on and gloves. They, the kids don't usually go way in there. And if they're hot, you should, you know, you don't want to check bees in a rainstorm or after it got tipped over and you usually don't mess with them at night. I don't do those things. Uh, and keep your bee suit on, keep a veil over your face. Uh, really, you don't want to sting in the eye. They, they're going to find the dark spots, right, and, and hit there. So you definitely do want to wear a suit when you visit your hives and, you know, uh, take care of things. Because, yeah, that, that you could lose some vision if they sting your eye real good, uh, and certainly so. So there's that stinger. It does pull out. It does continue to pump. You don't want to squeeze it out because there, look, this little sack. And you squeeze it out, that's not good. You want to get under it and pull it out though immediately because it's going to keep pumping that venom in there. Okay, so only those female bees have a stinger. The queen bee has a stinger too, but it doesn't have the barb, so she can sting repeatedly. It's not like you're going to really have that much trouble with the queen though. Uh, I recommend when you visit the hive, you don't even look for the queen. You just go in there and see that she's laying, find some evidence. You look at how much space is there, and that's all you got to worry about. If you're allergic to bees, you have a totally different bodily process going on. You have these special cells in your body called mast cells, and they have received a receptor for the bee venom. Your body has decided that bee venom is not venom, it's a tiny little parasite. And your body says, we swell up to stop parasites from going further into your body. But the only problem is it's not a parasite, it's this venom. And so you've, your body has these cells with receptors all over it, and they're super sensitive to the bee venom. And so the bee stings you and you swell up everywhere. And so that's, that's what the major allergic reaction is. They got these mast cells, they're exploding because they're ultra sensitive to the bee venom. This is not common, but if it is you, I would say don't keep bees. It's not worth it. They have somebody else do it for you. But uh, I carry an EpiPen uh, and I think that in your car or, you know, if you got a good doctor and you tell them that you're a beekeeper and you'd like an EpiPen so you could save somebody's life, they'll put it on your prescription. And if you got good medical care, you'll you just get an EpiPen, keep it in your car or keep it next to your beehives in case some kid gets, gets this. Uh, they're pretty easy to use and inject. But that's the emergency. And I want you to you know clearly understand that if somebody is having that big allergic reaction, you'll know because their whole body's going to swell up. And then what happens to their blood pressure? And then what happens to their breathing? And so on and so on. Okay. So what are we looking for in this hive? All right, well, when you go to your hive, you want to bring your smoker, your tool, a lighter, and then one more hive tool because you're going to lose the first one. And you're going to wear your suit. Typically, you smoke under the lid and wait a few minutes for the bees to calm down and the smoke to kind of cover everything up. And then you smoke the bees down into the frames as necessary. And you're going to remove the frames. Usually I do the end one and then I can slide them all over. And you kind of look at the laying pattern. Is there brood? Is there eggs? Do the bees have enough room? Uh, if the bees are, have no room, they'll start filling all those cells with honey. And that might trigger a crowding swarm, you know, swarm of bees. Now, in the spring, your second year, there may be another reason to prevent swarming, but usually your first year, you're not going to have to worry too much about swarms unless you don't give your bees enough space. So there's this fine line between too much space to defend and then not enough space, and then they get swarmy. Uh, generally, though, I would say eight out of ten frames full, that's about that time to put the new box on. Uh, you'll look to see if there's diseases and pests 
or if they started making queen cells and those kinds of things, you want to check for your honey harvest. That's what you're doing with your hive. So you're just enjoying your bees, checking up on their progress, seeing if they need extra space or not, and then off you go, and, and, and then that's that. Hopefully they make enough where they got that top box. See this top picture? There's, there's a one, two, three, four. This is box number five on my hive of mediums. And I put the bee escape, see the triangle maze? I put that in between the honey and the bees. It was a colder night, 50s, 60s. And so when all the bees got cold, they went downstairs and then my honey super was empty. They couldn't figure this maze back out. And so I took my comb and I crushed it into a five gallon bucket. And uh, there's cheesecloth and uh, I wrapped rope around the top of the cheesecloth to hold it, made it real tight. And then it just drains in there all night. And then or overnight or for an hour or two. And then I empty and fill my jars that way. So I got raw, uh, untreated, natural honey, crushed comb with pollen and anything else is in there in the honey. And then with the wax, I will separate that out. You can put a little screen for the bees to kind of have their legs kind of get a little scratch and uh, that'll scratch off a little pollen. And you could harvest pollen with one of these pollen separators. I haven't done that, uh, but one thing you do want to do is empty it regularly because pollen can grow. It's actually a growth stage of a plant. Uh, I know grow like the pollen tube and things. So you want to get that out of there, put it in the freezer or dry it. Uh, because it will get moldy and stuff. Here's my wax. I put all my wax into a pot with water and I heat it up until it's all melted into a big soupy mess. And the water underneath is sweet and it has all the leftover honey that I didn't quite clean off the comb. I take that and I brew it into honey wine, uh, mead, and I also distill it into honey whiskey and it's delicious. And then I take that big cake that is formed at the top of there and I put it in a, a can and I filter it out through a thin sheet of, this is called gossamer. I just find something really thin that's gonna stop those bee cocoons from traveling through. Those little cocoons are sometimes in your wax and then they're gonna make little splotches in there. So you'll separate your wax from the water, melt it and then pour it through. Some people are a little more cautious than I am. I did not do use a double boiler, but I'm a chemistry teacher and I know all about starting fires. So I could control this reaction very carefully here. Other people, maybe you'd want to do the double boiler and then pour through. And then you can put it into cool molds and make lip balm and things like that. All right, feeding bees. Bees feed each other. They're, the, anything you feed them is going to go through the whole hive. And there is a time to feed bees. You'd want to feed them in the early spring. Sometimes you catch a swarm in the early spring and they, there's no flowers or very few flowers, or maybe there's bad weather and it's cold. You'd want to give them something and you would just, here's the easiest way, you find a jar, poke holes in it, and then here's two sticks in there. You just put an empty box and two sticks in that and they could eat it. That'd be your emergency one. Another emergency one, Ziploc bag, honey or sugar water. How do you make this sugar water? It's one part sugar, one part water. That's the recipe. One part sugar, one part water. Uh, however size jar or water, put the same amount of sugar, put it in a bag, poke little holes in it. There you go, bees got it. So this is, this is the feeder for bees. Uh, an alternate form is uh, you could uh, put a newspaper on top and just dump dry sugar down. Uh, that's usually a wintering technique, but it would also work. Uh, if you if it was wet or something, uh, and the bees would be able to get you know this this would get all steamy anyway, and they'd start eating the sugar. It's a lot of sugar on that one for a spring thing, uh, but it would work in a pinch. So that's when you'd want to do it. You'd want to feed your bees in the spring. The rest of the year, honestly, I would just let them forage on their own and see how they do, because uh, the genetics of your colonies, you know what you want to have happen. They're, they're gonna be healthier on their own forage. They're gonna be more active foraging for nectar on their own instead of being fed all the time. They get kind of, some, some people say they get kind of lazy. I'm not entirely sure if they do or not, but um, th that's what I would say. I would say to uh, probably only feed in the spring. 
All right, let's get into the pests. This is a picture of the bee respiratory system. That's right, they have lungs throughout their entire body and there's little tiny holes and that's how they breathe. So that's why water doesn't kill them unless you put soap in it. Soap will make the water get small enough beads to go in the holes. Otherwise the water droplet's too big and it won't go in the holes. These holes have mites that live inside of their lungs, the trachea mite. So there's insects living inside of the bees called trachea mites. Uh, this is probably nothing you could do a whole lot about. In fact, I would say if you have bees, I think you should try to keep them as natural as possible. One of the main contaminants of your hive is things that people put in there to treat these mites and insects and stuff. Put the selective pressure where it belongs. Try to catch wild swarms, get uh, wild bees that live in your area and get some good genetics and um, good cleaning behavior, good mite fighting behavior. And that's the best way. Adjust your free space just right. Let them build their own cone. Let them do what bees do. Uh, but you know, otherwise there is, I'm, I'm not gonna say don't help your sick bees. Of course you're gonna wanna help do some things. So let's look at some of the methods for mite treatment. This one, I think they use menthol crystals and that helps dry them up in the bees. I really don't know exactly what you would be looking for to see if these mites were a problem. But this one is a typical mite. It is typically treated for, and there's a, a problem that they do. These are called varroa destructor mites and they slide in there right after that larva is big enough to spin its cocoon. And so they get capped in there with a the developing bee and they suck all his juice out. So this is a mite that uh, can decimate a hive if it's weak. You know, if it just swarmed and there's hardly any bees in there to defend the space and take these out, or maybe it's just a really weak hive, it got sick or it got, uh, had a big uh, winter moment where it got wet or something like that. And so one of the easiest ways to help these mites slide off the bees and fall through a screen is to put a screened bottom board in and then you put powdered sugar dust uh, through the hive uh, onto the bees and that makes them fall off. So that's a pretty non-invasive method uh, to help with the mites if you find that there's a lot of them. Uh, some people have boards and they'll, they'll put like grease on the boards under the screen board and they'll check for mite loads and things. That's more of an advanced thing. And I know a lot of you guys are kind of getting filled up to the brim with knowledge. So I'm going to keep going a little bit further and then uh, we'll, we'll probably, what time is it? I don't even know. How are we doing, April? We're doing well. Yeah, it's 10.55. Uh, it, well, it's, you've been going for 55 minutes. All right, so yeah, we're, we're about at what we were planning to do for an hour. So this is one method to treat. Here is like uh, some, some oxalic acid, formic acid, uh, vaporizing mineral oil. Those are all things that people do to treat these mites. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that go for a little bit uh, for a future class or for future questions, or uh, I have some resources for you to look and investigate on this. Here is that sticky board that I was talking about. So if mites are a problem, people have these screen bottoms and they can slide a board in there with grease on it and do a mite count and see if there's like a huge problem. Maybe the bees aren't building up enough and they're going slow and you're wondering what's wrong. You could test for the mites. Here is a problem you will see in storage for sure, wax worms. So these moths will lay their eggs in any comb that doesn't have bees in it so let's say you have a box that has old comb and you put it in the shed. They're going to do that. And these boss like kind of break their frames. They like bore into them a little bit. And so wax moths can be treated by this natural soil bacteria. And I, I highly recommend this one, the BT Azuay soil bacteria. You can find it. I'll have a link. You can find it on the bee source forums that I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, I spray all my stuff down with a little bit of this dissolved in water, like a couple of teaspoons in a gallon. And that stops all these moths 
And it also is really good on my garden stuff. It's good for the cauliflower and the broccoli and the cabbage. It gets those moths too. And it's organic up to the day of harvest use of a bioinsecticide. This is a harmless bacteria. This is the worst one, hive beetle. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, we both, both me and April are like, oh. If you give your bees too much space, these are going to hide in all the little cracks and they lay their eggs and they get nasty maggot like things and they'll go through the hive and eat the honey and pollen and they're bad. You could put boric acid things in CD cases and try to you know, give it to them. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, they have oil traps that they can fall into that they sell. You can do that. Uh, the best solution is to just control that space so the bees have just the right amount of space to defend and they will grow steadily and healthily as, as that. That's what I would say to do for all of these problems is to have good genetic bees from your local area and you can catch those swarms, believe me, just put a trap out. Even if you don't believe me, put a little, put a couple boxes with a little chunk of comb in there if you can get it some lemongrass, try to get all those things I got on that one slide there and just put it out there and check it every couple weeks. I promise some of you guys, I've, it's, it's so easy. Okay, where do you go from here? Here are some of my websites. I got fitzpatrickfarm.com. Okay, so that's my website. I just got a hex. I lost my password and it was really old and my friend Eli made it. And I had a, it took forever to get them. But anyway, I got it updated now. And uh, I do have a special section for starting up beekeeping there. And I got lots of links and help for you there. Uh, April's keeping track of these questions and I'm gonna look through those. I'll put answers there on there. I do got a Fitzpatrick Farm Facebook where I do a little homesteading and outdoorsy things. I do a lot of foraging uh, and that kind of stuff. I got a YouTube channel with a few shows on it. I think my most popular one was how to harvest amaranth. And then there's my email. If you're going to buy a book, I'd recommend the Beekeeper's Handbook. That's a solid book. That's gonna tell you how to run that Langstroth Hive and all about the bees. I have the link on my website too. Okay, online forums. The Bee Source Forum is golden. They have everything on there. They have beginners, experts, they have organic, non-organic, they got for sale. It's all there. Go there, read everything, and keep reading. There's so much great info on the bee source. This guy, Michael Bush, he's also a moderator on bee source, and he's got all this free info on bees on his website. So I would totally recommend going to Bush's site, uh, going to Bee Source site, and if you're interested, go to my site. And uh, you know, I got some cool stuff on there. I'm just, but I'm just starting into the in, into more professional YouTube stuff. So you'll see. Um, and that's that's where you want to go from here. I do have a couple cool slides of other things that are not honeybees. And you know, one thing you want to think of is that these honeybees are not native to North America. So you do want to make sure that, you know, you're not taking up space of native bees. Some of these stingless bees pollinate flowers that honeybees don't. This is called the sugar bag bee. These are in Australia. And then in South America, there's a stingless bee and uh, that also pollinates certain rainforest trees, right? So you might, maybe you don't want to do honeybees. Maybe you would like to raise bumblebees. You can catch a queen bumblebee in the spring or maybe wood boring bees or um, orchard bees, and you can have other bees that you enjoy at your house too. So uh, don't discount, you know, looking at alternative pollinators as well. I got a whole set of slides on those too. All right, how are we doing, April? Fantastic. That is, I'm just over the moon that we were able to get you on here because you've answered yeah. some questions for me. Let me see uh, what's going on in the Q&A here. Okay, Alex had said, this is my first year of beekeeping. Um, I'm in the Vancouver, Canada area. And on my last hive inspection, I noticed, oh, about 100 yellow jackets in each of my two hives. 
I have added a oh, reducer. Yeah. I've added a reducer to try and help the bees defend better. Do you recommend any other steps I can take to fight yellow jacket robbing? Yes, uh, at the end of the season is when everybody's trying to survive out there and those yellow jackets, they're gonna wanna come in there and get that honey. Uh, the best thing you can do is control the space that the bees have to defend and the yellow jackets are gonna come through the entrance. So if you're having a bunch of them go in there to rob, you might wanna reduce the entrance size to a smaller size and that's about the best you can honestly do. Uh, for that because then, then they can defend that small zone of entrance and keep them mostly out. My, oh, I never even heard of that. This is so interesting. Um, comment on required veterinary intervention for acquisition of antibiotics for treating disease in mites. Uh, yeah, there are, there are certain uh, d uh, things like uh, there's a nosemia disease. It's like a bacteria that bees get uh, and there is some medication for that. Uh, generally speaking, I don't see that as a problem in the wild swarms. Uh, I, I, like I said, my my philosophy is not to really treat. But I'm, I mean, if you just got a package and you're seeing like runny bee poop everywhere, and you know they got it, uh, why, you know, you want to try to at least, especially if it's your first hive, you definitely want to like try to do something so that you get bees that year. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise against it, especially if it's your first hive, uh, but I try to stay away from it. And uh, usually the I haven't had a wild swarm that has a, a problem there. Uh, Alex says, would you recommend adding an additional, uh, an additional super late in the season if they are filling up their existing space or would it be best to wait until springtime when the nectar is flowing again? Uh, that yeah, that, the nectar flow is the main thing. Uh, usually late in the year, they're not super into building comb. You know, like past July, it doesn't seem like they build a lot. Uh, you could try it out, you know, and experiment and see if they're going to keep building. But yeah, you know, after after if you and and you'll see it as they grow. You know, if they're not filling that last top box. But if everything is all absolutely full, sure, I'd put one on there and see what they do. I would probably use comb that's already drawn later in the year, just so they don't have to build it. Maybe they can just fill it in. Uh, but uh, if you don't have that, just see if they'll build it and uh, see what see what you get. If you find, I would inspect it though and uh, check to see if hive beetles are messing around up in there. Uh, and if, if they are, if it's starting to get nasty, I'd, I'd take it off and just put the cap down on another one. Uh, Alex is the same person who has the yellow jacket robbing, so I don't know if that makes a difference. In your oh head. yeah, well yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you might you might want to just hold off. Ooh, that's touchy. Yeah, I'm because they're not going to be able to get into that box if they go unless they go through the entrance. So it's it yeah, I'd I'd have to see how healthy they are at that time, you know, and that takes some experience. So uh, yeah, the main thing is that you want them to have enough to get through the winter. Honestly, if we're, uh, and that brings out the harvest in the fall, I leave most of my honey on. And in the spring, if they didn't get to it, I'll harvest it then. Bees prefer to eat nectar. So once nectar is available, you can take all that honey out of there. And uh, that's what I usually do to overwinter them. I'll just let them have the honey that they have and then just do it in the spring. That's just fine. Yeah. Wow. This is super interesting. If people have other really specific questions, like, can they contact you? Yeah, you can say, you can shoot me an email uh, and, uh, you know, ask. Also, I would recommend to go to that bee source forum, right. uh, get on there and th they'll probably be faster than I am. Right? The beekeeping 101, uh, that's that stuff. I would post questions on there and you'll get like immediate and there'll be several people to chime in. Yeah, uh, and often you, you could search on there, and the questions have already been asked most of the time too. So the B source form is really good. But I'll, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you have. Um, I'm gonna see if I can check Facebook Live. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and leave a, a question now. If it kicks us off, then I apologize. I operate <laughs> off of a hotspot out here, so. <laughs> Every single Zoom that you've tuned in on has been via hotspot. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty good hotspot. Knock on wood, knock on wood. 
So let me just see if there's any questions on, on that. Anyone else watching the Zoom right now? Hang on, I see another one. Alex has responded. Yeah, thanks. Um, just gonna quickly see on Facebook. Any other questions for you guys watching on Zoom? Uh, comments. Oh. No. Uh, no. Not on not on the Facebook live. There's comments, but not questions. And okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna let you get back to your evening, Dan. And I just cannot thank you enough for this information and that incredibly informative slideshow. Well, let's do this again. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I would love that. I'd love to do um, like a. a the next you know next step or troubleshooting is always a big one too yep. or we could pick another another subject they do too so yeah, it'll be right? fun. <laughs> okay. i'm looking forward to it. this is fun i like doing this with you april thanks thanks for the opportunity you bet um i will include oh, thank you for showing up i'll include all of the links uh in in the write-up here when it's posted on the website as well as on the newsletter and wherever else this is going to be posted so stay tuned and thank you for joining us and dan thank you so much we'll do it again Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Bye.